Well, praise the Lord. I've learned through every situation to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. <clears throat> when we are walking through the time of an eventual testimony, that is when you are truly proven. When you're walking through something and you haven't seen the other side yet, you're proving where your character and where your faith really is. This morning, there are some people in this building that are right in the middle of waiting on that miracle. They're right in the middle of walking through that valley, right in the middle of walking through that trial and that situation. But I've come to give you an encouraging word that through it all, you can trust in Jesus and you can trust his word. Amen. We started a series last Sunday night, and I tell you, God's just lit a fire in me about this because there's so many things that we wear and there's... So many, um, maybe some instruction, so much instruction God has wanted to give to his church. And he's trying to show us that what we wear really does matter. You say, well, you're talking about clothing? No, I'm speaking about the outer garments in the spirit realm that we wear. We focused on some things last Sunday. We <clears throat> talked about how, matter of fact, Colossians 3, that's going to be one of our main scriptures. We'll look at it again, but... We talked about some things that God wanted us to put on, such as to be clothed in compassion. That was one of the main things we covered. And today I want to begin with uh, the same scripture, Colossians 3, verse 12. And I want to start with kindness. So if you'll look to your screen, Colossians chapter 3, and I'm, I'm going to be a little out of style the way I'm dressed. Putting on a short sleeve shirt over a long sleeve shirt. Would you read Colossians 3 and 12 out loud with me today? Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. We've had revival. We've had great moves of God. We've had people speaking in tongues, filled with the Holy Ghost, healed, saved, sanctified, all the, all the above. But God started dealing with me about a week ago about what are you wearing Pastor Michael Knight, what is your church wearing in general? And God led me directly to Colossians chapter 3, and I wasn't sure what I would find there, but God knew. And so as we begin progressing in this, I want to look at the word underlined on your screen. I believe it's up there, kindness. And we'll start with that. There's a lot of websites that offer uh, ideas for random acts of kindness. There are websites that are entitled that, <clears throat> random acts of kindness. What are some random acts of kindness? If you got a neighbor that moves in to your neighborhood, take them something uh, nice, maybe a dessert, maybe ask them, what's your favorite meal I'd like to cook for you? Uh, offer them assistance in unpacking the U-Haul. Oh, boy, that's, that's kind of rough sometimes. I'm, I might hurt my back, preacher. Well, <clears throat> if, if, somebody, if you were moving and somebody came next door and offered to help you, it would be a wonderful blessing, wouldn't it? Maybe it's something as simple as complimenting the people you're around. Just compliment them. Just, you look nice today. I, I really appreciate your talent and the way you use it for the Lord. I, I think you're doing a great job here at work. Compliment people. When you go to stores and you're paying them to serve you, compliment those who serve you. 
Compliment the waitress. You've just done a fabulous job. Thank you for the way you took our order, and thank you for delivering our food, making sure it was right. Compliment people. Those are random acts of kindness. Send a nice text to someone who doesn't expect it. Pay for someone's meal behind you in the drive-thru. These are random acts of kindness. Proverbs 19, verse 22. Some of you are saying, Lord, move on the person in front of me today. <coughs> no, I said, Lord, move on you. <coughs> we, want, we want to be the one blessed, but it's time to be a blessing. What is desired in a man <coughs> is kindness. You know, you don't normally wake up in the morning with kindness. Now, some of you say, well, I'm, I try to be kind all the time. But you don't just wake up in the morning with a garment of kindness. You've got to put it on. You've got to make a conscious decision. I'm going to choose today to be kind to other people. I want us to go to Genesis chapter 39. The story of Joseph as he was held captive in the prison. Listen to verses 20 through 22. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him, what's that next word? Kindness. Kindness. <clears throat> and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he, has, he was made responsible for all that was done there. God showed kindness. Did you know kindness does not need a key to get through a prison door? Kindness can reach through solid steel if it has to. The kindness of God found its way through prison bars, and we're going to talk about another situation in uh, just a few minutes where God did it twice. <clears throat> but the kindness of God made its way from his throne room to a place of prison in Egypt, and, and Joseph, even in the midst of questioning, God, what's your will? God, how's this going to work in line with the dreams you have given me? Yet God said, I'll send you kindness, because even before I unlock the doors that hold you into your prison, I'm still going to show you my kindness. <clears throat> There's a point I need to make regarding this. That when you're at Walmart and someone is facing a huge financial mountain, just a smile on your face is not going to get them out of financial trouble. But it may begin the process of unlocking the door. Oh, hallelujah. See, that's where kindness comes into play. We've, we've, uh, <clears throat> we've misunderstood the power of kindness because we think, well, it can't really do much. If I smile, if I shake a hand, if I say, God bless you, how are you doing today? It really won't alter the, the situation they're in. It won't fix their marriage. It won't help their kids to behave properly. No, but it can put them into, on a path of changing their frame of mind to where God sets them up to receive the bigger miracle later. See, in order for, Josh, I mean, for Joseph to be set free from the prison, he needed a key of kindness to make its way through the prison doors before he was set free. I want you to think about that. So never underestimate the power of God's kindness through you. Your acts of kindness begin the process of setting people free. 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14, this is a conversation between Jonathan and David. We know that Jonathan was the son of Saul. He was a prince. And he looked at David and he said, But show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness, as long as I live so that I may not be killed. Now, this sounds odd. You'd think David would be asking this of Jonathan because Jonathan's daddy was king, but yet Jonathan saw the anointing on his best friend. He saw the, the, the prophetic gifts and word upon this young man that he, not Saul, not Jonathan, he would become king. And as he saw that anointing on his friend, he said, David, I want you to show me the kind of kindness that only God has. He says, I need you to show me unfailing kindness like the Lord's kindness. You see, there's different types of kindness. There's kindness that you're accustomed to giving and receiving, and then there's God's unfailing kindness. <clears throat> what am I talking about? Well, there's kindness that, that when somebody does you wrong, or no, let's, let's, let's not go that far. Let's say that you got in an argument, and you know you were right, Selena. You know you were right, and Aaron was wrong. I don't care what he says. You know you were right. Later on, about uh, uh, two days down the road, something happens, and Aaron gets a revelation. My wife, as usual, was right. <clears throat> Let me tell you what kindness will do. Instead of saying, yeah, you sorry dog, you should have listened to me, you better, next time don't you dispute my word. Instead of going that route, kindness doesn't even acknowledge 
that they were right and the person was wrong. They, they allow the person to understand themselves, yes, I was wrong, and then kindness never rubs it in. Isn't that interesting? See, kindness doesn't look for an opportunity to pounce on somebody's flaws. Kindness looks for ways to say, well, next time we'll figure it out again together, and next time we'll, we'll just be careful how we talk to one another. Now, that's in a perfect world, isn't it? We'll be careful. <coughs> Most human beings struggle to act like that Jonathan said I need the kind of of kindness that is unfailing I want to make sure David when you become king that your kindness does not run out even if my my father does things like hunt you down and try to kill you I want to make sure when we make this vow to one another that you're going to show me the kind of kindness that only God can show that the kind that God trained us to show unfailing kindness Isaiah 54 and 8 with a little wrath, I hid my face from you for a moment. This is God speaking. But with everlasting kindness, I will have mercy on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. How many are thankful for everlasting kindness? Ooh, glory to God. There's another wardrobe now that we've covered humility. No, I'm sorry. We've covered kindness. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Now we're going to look at humility, the wardrobe of humility. How many love the silence? <laughs> the next garment I want to look at is the garment of humility, Colossians 3, 12 again. Read it with me. Therefore, as God's chosen people, it sounds like it's not on the screen. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Look at your neighbor and say, you need a little more humility. <laughs> a truly humble man is hard to find. How many of you have heard of the Tuskegee Institute? How about Booker T. Washington? Lived in late 1800s, early 1900s. There's a story that tells us, a true story, that when Booker T. Washington came to Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, he was walking into an exclusive section of town when he stopped by and there was a wealth or he was stopped by a wealthy white woman now she didn't know who he was and she uh, asked him to start chopping up some wood for her for a few dollars and stack it into her house well he obliged her and he chopped up that wood he carried every last log into the house and she paid him, and he went on his way. Well, uh, there was a little girl there, of all people, who recognized that Booker T. Washington was uh, coming to the Tuskegee Institute, to, uh, to a place of high rank. And she told the, wo the wealthy woman, the wealthy white woman, and uh, the woman was so embarrassed. So the next day, she goes to the Tuskegee Institute, and she finds Mr. Washington, and she apologizes to him uh, because she did not realize who he was. Now, I thought that his response was so humble. He said, it's perfectly all right, madam. Occasionally, I enjoy a little manual labor. Besides, it's always a, del a delight to do something for a friend. Now, he didn't know her, but he was showing her that he was an humble man. What happened? The woman got together with a bunch of her wealthy friends, came again, met with Booker T. Washington, and they donated thousands of dollars to the Tuskegee Institute because of his humble nature. Voluntary humility is always better than forced humility. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. James 4 and 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. There's someone who is much greater than us that laid a pathway of humility and his name is Jesus. And we see in Philippians 2 verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Let's talk about the humility of Jesus for a moment. Let's think of the angels who had guarded Jesus from the time he was a baby. How odd it had to be when Jesus walked down a road in the middle of Nazareth and nobody bowed. You ever thought of that? I mean, here's these high-ranking angels, probably Michael the archangel or Gabriel was one of them. I don't know. But I could see them standing there with their swords, making sure no demon touches the Messiah. And here goes Jesus walking as a carpenter, walking down the, the, uh, the roads of Nazareth, and nobody bows to him. 
How odd it must have been for the angels to try to understand humility when all they had ever known was a, a Jesus, a son of God, who was worthy of 24 hours a day worship nonstop. How odd it must have been the first time that Jesus hit his thumb with a hammer and they looked and, and he, he went, oh, I mean, just think of that. Jesus had never been hurt before. They had never noticed pain uh, associated with their king. And yet here was the Son of God who created all things, just hit his thumb with a hammer and was in pain. How odd it must have been to have to watch the humility of Jesus. And even worse must have been the very first time when Jesus stood before the Sanhedrin and before the high priest, and when he responded, this man, this servant, this guy comes up and slaps Jesus right in the face. I wonder if, if Michael grabbed his sword and pulled it about halfway out of the sheaf, and God said, no, I don't know. But I wonder, because all I can imagine is Michael saying, you ain't going to touch my master. How dare you strike my Lord? And yet he was restrained because it was all part of an humble plan. Humility will take you down roads you didn't plan on going on. We think when we hear a message by a pastor, be humble. Well, praise God, I'll be humble and I'll see great things and I will be exalted in due time. Well, yeah, but due time takes a while. Can I get an amen? amen. That's why he said in due time. He wanted to make sure you understood it is not instantaneous. It's not immediate when you humble yourself that you're going to be exalted because God will let you stay down there for a while so you can learn some things in the dirt you could never learn on the mountaintop. Amen? So we see here that Jesus humbled himself greatly. He became obedient. It didn't stop with a slap. It didn't stop with a crown of thorns or a beating on the back. But Jesus humbled himself until he reached the top of Mount Calvary, gave his life on Golgotha's hill on an old rugged cross, and died for us. That was the ultimate sign of humility. Humility opens doors that pride can never open. It leads to eventual exaltation while pride leads to a devastating fall. I've heard it's good to give flowers to people while they're alive instead of waiting until they die. I want to give uh, compliments to a man today who's not here. He wouldn't be here. He's a pastor, Jeff Stanford of the uh, Free Life Church in Sardis. This is a man that every single time I've had any type of dealings with him, he's been humble. Every time I've done flooring in his whole house. I've uh, dealt with him on a spiritual level in church, MIP, went and preached for him. This man, I mean, is blessed and anointed and as much authority as God has given him, he's always humble. The other day I was going to meet uh, my parents, me and my family was going to meet my parents at the top of the river. And who walks out? Here comes Brother Jeff and Sister Joy Stanford. And they come walking out and first thing, well, hey there, Brother Michael. And, of course, he says something funny. He's always funny to me. But he's, I, I'm just thinking this is a man who could easily just walk on by, a man who could be too busy, uh, a man who could think, well, <clears throat> I, I, I mean, I'll just say, God bless you and just move on. But this is a man who will stop and he takes time and he talks to you as if, as if you're brothers, which is true, brothers and sisters in the Lord. And that is something that stands out to me about that brother. Now, there's a lot of people in this room just like that. There's a lot of you that are humble. You don't act stuck up. You don't act better than people. When they see you, you're always the same. And that's a wonderful blessing. But when you walk in humility, you realize that the only reason you're anything is because of the God who's in you. The only reason that you're saved is because you didn't go to Calvary. Your mama didn't go to Calvary. Jesus went to the old rugged cross so that you could have everlasting life. So the only reason that we have of, of any type of glory or greatness is only through Jesus Christ. I want to tell you a story about a man named King Manasseh. This is the second instance I wanted to point out about God making his way through the prison bar. Second Chronicles 33, verses 11 through 13. Let me set this up for you. There was a king over Judah, evil dude. I'm going to tell you a little more about him in just a moment. This guy was horrible, as Roxy Jane would say. He was horrible. That's our word. And, and so he, he got so bad and prophetic word kept coming. There's wrath coming. There's destruction coming. He would not change. He would not listen. So what happened? He got carried off, the Bible says, in fetters, in chains. He was shackled. Verse 11, Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off. To Babylon. Now, while in prison, Manasseh had a lot of time to think. 
See, we don't understand this, but sometimes God lets us get in our own prisons so we can start thinking again. Hmm. Let that sink in just a moment. Well, it's not God's will I ever be bound. I didn't say it was. But God didn't get put Manasseh, or, or God's actions didn't cause Manasseh to go to prison. Manasseh's actions called him to go to prison. Our attitudes and our actions and our selfishness and our greed and our other issues lead us into our bondage. God does not lead us there. But what we do find is that once we get there, God's able to use the same bars that could bring us torment to bring us redemption. He, he uses that same containment, that same bondage, in order to teach us a lesson that we would never learn as long as we stayed on the throne back at Judah. But God says, I'm going to let you, highly exalted one, I'm going to let you be lowered, your crown removed, your robe stripped off of you. I'm going to cause you to be pulled by chains to a place you don't want to go. Because you'll never find humility as long as you stay on the throne. So God took him there by using the Assyrian army. Listen to some of the horrible things that Manasseh did in 2 Kings 21, verse 16. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood. Now, here it goes. Till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Besides his sins, by which he made Judah sin in doing evil in the sight of of the Lord. He led an entire nation to a debaucherous lifestyle. Now there was still some good people. There was a remnant. There were folks who loved the Lord. And there were good priests. But as a whole, the nation went in the direction of evil. And Manasseh was right at the front, leading the way like a drum major in front of a high school band. He was making sure everybody made their way on this path toward destruction. What really amazed me was it said he caused Jerusalem to be, to be filled with blood from one end to another. That means this guy was a murderer. He might not have done the deed himself, but he, through his captains and through his bodyguards and whoever else he used, he murdered thousands and thousands of people. So now Manasseh is sitting in prison. He's not home anymore. He can't get his favorite meals like he used to. He can't have somebody come and polish his crown and ask him what kind of tea or water or drink would you like today, uh, king? There's no one there to wait on him hand and foot, only someone who throws a platter with some maybe some uh, baked beans and potatoes, uh, something that he really didn't care for, maybe threw a, a little roll on there and said, hey, eat up, you old king. And here he sits, and all he can think about is the murderous, activities of his reign and he thinks about the the awful way he treated people and he thinks about all the souls who are burning in hell right now because he led a nation to destruction go to that next scripture so here's Manasseh and he's sitting in prison and he's staring at bars and there seems to never be an opportunity for freedom again and the Bible says now when he was in affliction he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. The Bible said he humbled himself greatly. Remember I just made a statement just a few moments ago that it's a lot better to choose humility to than to have forced humility. Initially, Manasseh had forced humility because he was forced to go into a place he never wanted to go. But then the Bible says he made a decision himself. He humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. As long as Manasseh had a crown on his head, he had pride that blocked his view of reality. God stripped Manasseh of his home so that he could find his true home. God stripped Manasseh of royal power so that he could find supreme power. And God removed Manasseh from a lifestyle of being served all the time so that he could find the true treasure and serve the true king. So what happens? Here's Manasseh. He's crying out to God. He's humbled. He's lowered himself. And he received, according to the scripture, his entreaty. And let me, let me fill in for the pronouns here so you understand who I'm talking about. And God received Manasseh's entreaty, heard Manasseh's supplication, and brought Manasseh back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. Humility made its way, just like kindness, 
through the prison bars. Humility found a way past those guards that were holding spears and swords and shields and were clad in the latest, greatest armor. Yet humility found its way past all of these walls that tried to block them. As Manasseh put on the garment of humility, he was enabled to finally communicate with the God who had been knocking on his door ever since he had sat on the throne in Judah. God had been trying to communicate. God had been trying to get Manasseh's attention. He'd sent prophets. He'd caused natural disasters to happen. He kept knocking on the door of Manasseh's heart. But it wasn't until he reached prison that God was finally able to communicate with him. The Bible says that he began to cry out and call upon God. He put on the garment of humility. 1 Peter 5, verse 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. If God's going to use a church, it's going to have to be a church of humility. A church that doesn't get stuck up, doesn't get proud of its talents and gifts, doesn't get proud when God gives us a new building. Oh, we're the stuff now. <laughs> when God sends us a million dollars if he chooses to, oh, we're big time now. If you ever get beyond the same heart that you've got when you're running 50 people and bringing in a few thousand a month, you're going to be in trouble. Because the Bible declares we must remain humble in order for God to exalt us. Once he exalts people, he expects them to keep the same heart they had when they were in the low place. Here's what's about to happen. Some of you that are going through some trials, God's about to do some miracles for you. He's going to bring you up and bring you out, and it's going to be fantastic what God does. But here's the word you're going to have ringing in your ears when that miracle takes place. And I'm counting on one myself. When the miracle takes place, we've got to hold fast to the word being spoken today. You better stay humble when God gives you your miracle. Humility is required for us to please our Father. There's one more garment I want to cover today. Garment of gentleness. Go ahead and put that next scripture up there again. Colossians, I think it is. Colossians 3, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness. Somebody say gentleness and patience. When I worked at Food World, you've heard some of my stories. Maybe this one is a new one to some of you. I remember that when I was bagging groceries, there was a couple who were standing there, and I'd never heard of a silo before, just to make clarification of where I'm going with this. And they had a big old... Looked like a 50-pound bag. That might have been heavier than that. That sucker was gigantic. 50-pound bag of dog food. And there was this canister that sat right near the windows that said, Feed Hungry Pets, Hungry Animals. And so I'm sitting here, and I'm about to pick up this dog food, and I start to put it in the buggy, and I hear, No! Like, Sir, put it in the silo. Now, I'm not kidding when I, when I say they talk like the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> put it in the silo. And I'm thinking, Sir? I thought he was saying put it on the side of the buggy, you know, like maybe shift it. So here I am. I'm, I'm messing around with this thing that's as heavy as me. I weigh like 120. And here I am. I'm trying to shift this thing in the buggy. I said put it in the silo. I, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and so I start shifting it again. Now the woman gets involved. Look, he said put it in the silo. I'm like, silo, what, what are you talking about? The silo! And they pointed, and, and I mean, by this time, everybody up front is looking at me, and they're thinking, just stick it in that stinking silo. And I look, and oh, there's a, a canister with a little dog on it. And I thought, that's it. And so I pick it up, I carry it with all my strength, and I drop it in that silo, and I walk back over there, and I continue to serve these people by bagging their groceries as if nothing ever happened. I'm showing them gentleness. I'm being gentle, even though I just uh, was made to look pretty goofy in front of everybody. I wish they'd said that son, that canister over there with the dog on it. Wouldn't that have been nice? But no. Put it in the shallow. I'm, I'm thinking, man, I wish the spirit of gentleness would like knock you out and pick you, <laughs> resurrect you back up and, and speak out of you. Amen. Glory to God. Yeah. Uh, but I remain gentle 
even though these people were beginning to act pretty ugly, as if I was supposed to understand everything in the world, and just because they said silo, I was supposed to know what it meant. I, I was being gentle regardless of how they treated me. I want to tell you something, that gentleness is going to bring back many rewards that uh, you being right and you being, uh, well, nobody's going to step over me. Nobody's going to treat me that way. That kind of attitude will not bring the rewards that gentleness will bring. Gentleness is a, a, a way of acting in which, believe it or not, a lot of times you're going to get your way. I know that sounds selfish, but you're going to get your way by being quiet and humble and calm and gentle with people more than if you holler louder than they can. <laughs> you're not going to accomplish much when, when you're trying to out-holler somebody else because, trust me, they're not listening to you. All their, their, their voice is a lot closer to their ears than your voice. <laughs> Amen. And they're screaming their guts out, so they're not going to hear you. Gentleness is a valuable commodity in the life of a Christian because there's going to be people who cannot relate to you. Why in the world do you go to Bible study? Why in the world do you go to prayer meetings? What's the deal when they have revival? Why can't we go out to Applebee's on Tuesday? You said you got to be at revival and you're trying to get me there. I don't want to go there. What's wrong with you? People will talk to you like there's something wrong with you because you love the Lord and you're so uh, interested in being in his presence. And you talk about him more than, than most of their friends. And they're going to say, what's wrong? Why is it that you're so consumed? Are you in a cult? You're going to be like, no, I've just found the one who is my eternal Savior. I've found the one, and he found me, that washed my sins away, and he'll do the same for you. See, there's a change that comes over you, and people won't understand it until they experience it. It's just like being married. You know, you try to talk to people who are single about the, the virtues of marriage and, and how that you need to conduct yourself. Well, they don't have a clue until they've been married and they live with that person that they're married to. They don't understand what you're talking about. Oh, we're in love and everything's perfect. We're dating. I'm sure it is perfect. You don't go home with one another. You ain't got to worry about washing dishes or the, the clothes being in the dryer and why I need to get in the, uh, put my other clothes in the washer. You don't know about having to pay power bills and phone bills and cell phones. And oops, the power got cut off this week. Why? Because I made my car payment. Uh-oh. And, and you don't know about that stuff when you're dating. But when you're married, you try to give wisdom to people who have not yet been there. You don't understand. Sinners do not relate to Christians. They can't understand your commitment to God. They don't understand why you'd ever kneel down and pray more than two minutes. They can't understand why you get ecstatic in worship and you shout and the Holy Ghost moves on you and you dance all the way across the, the altar area. It doesn't make sense to them. It's because they've not experienced what you've experienced. So you've got to have a spirit of gentleness with those who cannot comprehend what you are or, or who you are and your relationship with the king. I want you to listen to a scripture in Hosea 11 about a gentle God. He's speaking of Israel, and sometimes Israel was re referred to as Ephraim. Hosea 11, verses 3 and 4, I taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. You know, this reminds me of when you're a parent, and when you, you grab hold of your child's hand. Matter of fact, this happened to me yesterday. I believe we were, yeah, we were walking down the steps in our house, and Roxy Jane was, um, I think she was right behind me. But I remember she was trying to hurry. And, you know, you always tell kids, don't run downstairs. And so what happens, she, she got in a hurry and made her way past me. And, I mean, as soon as she hit that third step, she starts doing like that. Well, what do I do? I swing my arm and I stop her because I'm close enough where I can grab her. If I had not been there, it would have been bad. I mean, she could have really gotten hurt on those wood, wood stair treads. And so as I kept her close, it allowed me to offer an assistance that I could not offer if I was distant from her. See, that's why parents try to stay close enough to where we can alter what might happen and, and make sure that we're able to protect them and, and keep them safe so we can guide their future to an extent. That's why it's hard sometimes when we let them go to school and, and maybe when they go spend the night with someone and when they get their first boyfriend, their first girlfriend, their first date. Oh, my goodness, I want to ride in the back seat <laughs> with my girls. When they go on their first date, they're probably glad they're not in here hearing that. But, you know, you're just thinking all the crazy stuff that could happen. Even them not paying attention and the guy swerving off the road or something. I mean, just crazy stuff. 
And we want to stay close. And realize there comes a point where we have to trust that they'll take all the wisdom we poured into them and they'll use it. But the Bible said that when they were young, he said, I drew them, I took them by their arms. He said, I taught them to walk. They did not know that I healed them. There's a lot of things we do for our children that they never realize until they grow up and they get married and they say, oh, wow, this is what daddy gave up so that I could play softball. This is what mama gave up so that I could uh, have nicer clothes when she would wear stuff that she had had for 10, 15 years, and it was really going out of style. And I used to kind of look at her and be like, mama, you need to get with it. But, but I was the one wearing the nice clothes when I went to school and looked uh, like everybody else, and I didn't realize it, but she was spending money on me instead of spending money on herself. See, we don't realize a lot of that stuff till we get into the position of marriage and family and parenting ourselves. And that's what God was explaining about Ephraim. He said, I taught Ephraim how to walk. Israel did not even exist if I had not spoken it into existence. There would be no Israel, there'd be no Judah if not for God. And God said, I'm the one who taught you how to walk. He said, I took them by the arms. And they didn't even realize I was the one healing them. How well do we relate to this church? I know you've related some when I was talking about parenting, but how about we get on the spiritual side right now? We just talk about how many times God's took us by the hand and the times where Michael Knight almost fell down the stairs spiritually and God swung out his arm and he caught me before I crumbled under the pressure of life. How many times have you been met with family issues to a point where your uh, family, there was a divorce and it felt like it was going to rip you to shreds and you never saw a way you could make it past this week and God said, but I'm still right there in the middle. I'm still walking beside you. You don't even realize it, but I'm the one teaching you to walk in the midst of the prison bars, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of divorce, in the midst of all the strife, in the midst of, of bankruptcy. I'm the one who's walking right there with you with you see that's the kind of God we have we have a God who's compassionate and who's loving and gentle and kind and he as he taught Ephraim Israel to walk he also does the same for us the Bible said in verse 4 I drew them with gentle cords he used that word purposely with bands of love and I was to them as those who take the yoke from their neck I stooped and I fed them do you realize what God's saying He's saying, I stooped for a reason. You see, God never has to stoop to our level. God never has to forgive us. God never has to save us. God never has to deliver us. But guess what he did? He made a conscious decision of his own that I'm going to save them anyway. I'm going to deliver them when they don't deserve it. I'm going to love them even though I don't have to, but I choose to because that is my nature. That's what we need to start grasping at the New Haven Church of God. That even though the Lord didn't have to do anything for us, He chose to because of His nature. Every one of these garments, we're going to keep going until God stops me. Every one of these garments that God's telling the church of New Haven that we've got to start wearing and we've got to keep them on, it's for the purpose of allowing people to experience the kindness and the mercy and the grace and the goodness and the humility, the love of God. Brother Gary was all over it this morning in his Sunday school class about the kind of attitude we've got to have and the fruit we've got to bear. But what I see is that in these last days, we've got to get the wardrobe and, and put into the wardrobe and we've got to start changing what we're wearing and we've got to quit looking like ourselves and we've got to start looking like Jesus. Amen. We've got to reach a place where that when we put on the things of God, those are the things that dominate our speech and our behavior. And the way we talk to people must be exactly like what we're wearing. If I'm going to say that I'm humble, I better be humble. I'm going to tell you, Aaron Bowley, in these latter days, as I've gotten older, I'm able to detect humility in someone a lot quicker than I used to when I was young. Somebody approaches me and they're all about them. Somebody approaches me and they've got all the gifts you could ever imagine. It's all about, oh, I'm used in this and this and this. And I'm, hey, I've got a chart, Pastor. I can hand it to you just so you'll know how I can flow in your church. Don't ever approach me like that. That's not humility. 
in order to truly function in ministry, you better have humility right at the top. Amen. That I come as a servant. I come with an attitude, not that I'm in charge, but I come with an attitude that I'm here to assist in whatever way is needed. That's the kind of people we got here. We got a lot of awesome workers. I brag on you guys quite a bit, letting other people know that we've got such a powerful group of workers and people willing to submit and to work to carry out the vision that it's amazing. And God already knows that we've got people willing to work, but here's the thing that he also knows. It's been too long since some of us have worn these garments I've been preaching about. Well, Pastor, I thought I was kind to people. I thought I was humble at times. I thought I was gentle. Well, sometimes we are. But we've been visiting the wardrobe too frequently and taking off the things we were supposed to keep on us. See, as Brother Gary was saying in Sunday school, there will be people coming in this church who are going to have sin problems. They're going to be different from some of you. Matter of fact, they're probably like some of your past, but they're not like you are now. And they, they look more like what you don't want to think about. And so sometimes we put those people off at a distance because it reminds us of who we used to be. But yet God says, use your past as a valuable asset to minister to those who are dealing with the same issues. God is calling us to become like the prophet Hosea just spoke. He said, I'm looking for a church in Southside, Alabama that will bow down, stoop down to the level, not to enter into sin, but to get down to where, where the sinner doesn't have to look up into the sky with sunglasses and find you somewhere up there. He said, I need you to do like my son Jesus. I, I want you to get down in the dirt with them so that you can lift them up as you lift yourself up. When you're raising up, I want you to be able to lift them up. So what, what's happening is, and I know this sounds elementary, but as I'm getting up, I'm actually showing them how to get up at the same time they're doing the same motion. As I go up, I'm saying, this is how you do it. The Bible says he stooped down to where that Ephraim was. In order to show them as I lift up, you can also do the same with my power. Clothe yourselves. I drew them with gentle cords. Be gentle with one another. Please be gentle with your spouse. Please be gentle with your children. Please be gentle with those that you work with in ministry. Please be gentle. Because every one of us are going to have bad days and we're going to have stress. And there will be times that we, are, as Brother Neil said, we're going to feel like giving up sometimes. And we need people, instead of jumping on us saying, you're pathetic, you shouldn't ever get that way, what's wrong with you, you backslidden piece of garbage, instead of going that route, you know what you're supposed to do? Well, brother, I am here for you, and we're going to see you through this, and this mountain's going to be a molehill in just a few minutes because as we start praying and laying hands on you and declaring the promises of God and the prophecies that have been foretold, we're going to see a complete turnaround. And by, by the word of God, you're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's going to be a, a brain transplant about to happen in this building. There's going to be a miracle in your thought process. See what can happen when people in unity come together and they begin declaring what God's going to do and what he's already promised instead of how bad you feel. It's how far you're going, how high you're going to climb. That's the will of God and it's up to us to be gentle with one another. When people are going through battles, we got to be gentle with one another. we got to be kind and we have to remain humble. It's no matter what position that we're given in ministry or in the world. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit of the living God. Holy Spirit of the living God. Your will be done. God, I believe that I've, I've spoken what you placed on my heart. And I'm asking you now, that Lord, you would have your will and way and that whatever you decide you want to say or do, God, whatever fruit you're wanting to birth from this word in the lives of the people that's set before me, I pray, God, it's going to take place. It's going to happen. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you.
Well, your pastor feels like it's a time for prayer, a time for the entire church to pray. We have this ever so often where we come and we just find a place to pray. There's nothing specific, not necessarily drawing attention to anyone needing specific prayer. It's just a corporate prayer. And I want you to come and let's find a place. Let's spend time with the Lord. I believe he's going to start talking to some people in this room. Some things that weren't even spoken from the pulpit. Amen. Just take as much time as you need.